Hello, good evening, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Uh, as all of you are coming in, uh, I just want to give everyone an opportunity to join. Uh, I am so excited to share with you all tonight. Um, I'm a little frustrated and a little disappointed if I'm honest with you, uh, because I'm not sharing with you directly from my the camera that I usually use. Um, so uh, please pray for my computer and my and my other tech equipment that that stuff starts uh, working again. Um, but I am so excited about the word tonight. Uh, tonight we are going to go to the book of Esther. If you have your Bibles, I still love a paper Bible. Um, the book of Esther chapter seven, verses one through four. Uh, but if you've got me up, maybe add another tab or pull me up on your phone and just multitask right on over to you version, pull up Esther chapter seven and verse one. I really want you to read this alongside me. The word of the Lord says that the king and Haman came to feast with Esther the queen once again. On the second day while drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Queen Esther, whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you seek, even to half the kingdom will be done. Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your eyes, your majesty, and if the king is pleased, spare my life. This is my request and spare my people. This is my desire. For my people and I have been sold to destruction, death, and extermination. If we had been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. This evening, I want to speak to us under the title, For My People. For My People. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for another opportunity to just come into your presence, to have a conversation with you, to have an encounter with you. And God, despite whatever has happened this week, we pray and ask that you have your way in this moment. And Lord, I pray and ask that you take complete control and that someone has a transformative experience with you as a result of of your holy word. Remove me, hide me behind the throne of grace, and let your word be the only word that is heard. It is in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. For my people everywhere, singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. This is the opening stanza in Margaret Walker's famous poem, For My People. Originally published in 1942, Walker uses imagery and metaphor to personify who her people are. In fact, throughout the poem, Walker classifies her people as those who sing songs of sorrow and jubilee, who bend their knees to an unseen power, who live on 47th in Chicago and on Lenox in New York. She continues describing her people as an enslaved people, a confused people, an emotionally broken people, but also a deeply religious people, a faith-filled people, a determined people, a people not simply overcome by sorrow, but filled with much joy and laughter. These people, Walker bemoans at the end of her poem to, quote, let a people of loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our bloods. Let a race of men now rise and take control, end quote. This woman, is calling for a revolution that shifts the socio-political tide from that of destruction, death, and extermination to that of life, liberty, and freedom. 
Margaret Walker is not the first black woman to call for a revolution of such time shifting proportions. In fact, black women have been the backbone, the hands, the feet, and even the brains behind our social movements for years. I mean, there's no emancipation without Harriet. There's no civil rights without Rosa and black lives would continue to not matter without Patrice Culler, Elisa Garza, and Opal Tometi. Black women have always been at the heart of not just our calls for revolution, but they have been the fuel maintaining them. It is this reality of Black women's central involvement in our past and present social justice movements that has me wondering why the Black church continues to promote activism, continues to project the work of social justice as a prophetic anointing reserved exclusively for those anatomically classified as male. Why does the Black church uh, uh, celebrate the activism of Dr. Martin Luther King with no mention of Diane Nash? Why does the Black church celebrate the activism of Nelson Mandela with no mention of Miriam Makeba? Why does the Black church celebrate the activism of Reverend Jesse Jackson with no mention of Shirley Chisholm? I believe one of the reasons why the black church is more comfortable with men as the spokespersons for justice, why the black church continue, uh, continues to share and chronicle the lives of men who have led and continue to lead the work for social justice, why the church champions the efforts of male leaders engaging in the work of social justice is because our social justice theology is based exclusively on the activism of men in the Bible. Every social justice sermon you hear is either on Moses, the great emancipator, Nehemiah, the weeping prophet, Micah, the justice expositor, or Paul and Silas, the great liberators. This patriarchal misogynist lens through which we read social justice in the Bible has erased the female activists of scripture and delivered the message that activism is best enacted by men. We have inadvertently told our girls that it is okay to support a man's social justice vision, but it's not okay to have your own. We taught our daughters it's okay to be the sounding board to a man's prophetic voice, but it's inappropriate for you to develop your own by separating the women of the Bible from their engagement in the social justice issues of their time. We have invariably taught our girls that it is normal, yea, honorable, to be hidden in a man's shadow. It's normal, yea, honorable, to work for freedom, to sacrifice for equality, to die for justice, and be forgotten. Now, don't get me wrong. These men did phenomenal work for justice and activism, and we would be lost in our attempts at practicing social justice without their example. But today is a day that we are going to celebrate the history of protest and persuasion as demonstrated by powerful Black women. This is significant because if we're honest, many of our contributions remain unchronicled, our sacrifices continue to go unacknowledged, and our strategic ability repeatedly goes unappreciated. How is it, how is it, saints, that mothers like Georgia Gilmore could feed the leaders and fundraise for the boycotts and yet go unacknowledged for sustaining them? How is it that grandmothers like Prathia Hall could out-preach the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for motivating them? How is it that aunts like Anna Lee Williams could sing for the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for inspiring them? How is it that sisters like Diane Nash could create political strategy for the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for equipping them? See, the truth is, such intentional erasure of black women from our communal narrative of justice and activism is steeped in a long history of sexism. In fact, Margaret Walker said in 1979, quote, even in pre-Civil War days, black women stood in the vanguard for equal rights, for freedom from slavery, for recognition of women as citizens and co-partners with men in all of life's endeavors. However, because of the nature of American history and particularly because of the institutions of slavery and segregation, the names and lives of black women leaders are all but unknown in American society, end quote. 
See, scholars like Bernice McNair Barnett surmise this uh, practice is because although they have traditionally performed crucial roles and have been considered the backbone in the church, uh, black women historically have not been allowed the opportunity to become ministers, deacons, or trustees, uh, the heads and top decision makers uh, in the male dominated hierarchy of the black Baptist church, end quote. Now this lack of willingness uh, to give black women legitimized and coveted positions of power influences our inability to acknowledge certain gifts and capabilities within them, let alone the, the, the contributions made to church or community. And to be clear, this is not a problem exclusive to the Black Baptist Church. Hello, we know firsthand what it means for a Chinese female minister to pastor the largest SDA congregation in the world and yet be refused ordination. We know firsthand what it means for female ministers to be granted seminary training and never offered pastoral positions. We know firsthand what it means for women in general and women in particular particular to be denied the opportunity to function in critical positions of power with the proper backing and authority. Womanist theologian Jacqueline Grant posits that there has been a misunderstanding surrounding the complement backbone. See, while black women have taken it to mean that we are a sturdy skeletal structure keeping every single aspect of protest programming in operation, it seems as though in the words of Grant, quote, most of the ministers who, ministers who use the term have reference to location rather than function. What they really mean is that women are in the background and should be kept there, end quote. But the truth is, had it not been for the courage of black women, the protests of black women as a people, we'd still been sold to destruction, death, and extermination. Our freedoms, our prophetic voice, our political strategy, our inspiration, and our sustenance, we owe to a host of black women who woke up every morning and said, for my people, this justice anthem first rang out in 478 BC during the reign of Persian King Ahasuerus, ruler of 127 provinces from India to Kush. Queen Esther, who had just been promoted from the king's harem to now queen of all Persia, is made aware that the Jews are facing the threat of genocide for no other reason than their nationality and culture. Her cousin Mordecai comes to her and says, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this realizing that her people are victims of targeted systematic and institutional extermination, Queen Esther must learn quickly, hear me, that her economic status cannot save her. She has to learn that marrying a rich Persian man can't save her, that earning a Persian degree can't save her, that having Persian friends can't save her, that living in the most respected Persian house can't save her, that no matter what she does and who she associates with and what she puts on to assimilate to the Persian culture surrounding her, that the fact of the matter is she's still a Jew. And injustice against any Jew is a threat to justice for every Jew. See, if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were writing during her time, I believe that Mordecai would have quoted him in his conversation with Esther to get her to understand her susceptibility to the decree and thus her own inability to avoid the consequences of it. I hear him telling her, quote, that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. And I believe that this is a truth that many of us have failed to see in 2021. Whew. 
See, just like the Jews, Africans are a large and dispersed people who occupy many lands and are a part of many tribes. There are Africans on every continent and in almost every country. According to Harvard's African Languages Program, Saba, the continent of Africa is one of the most linguistically diverse continents on the globe. See, on the continent alone, there are anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 different languages spoken across 54 different countries that are home to approximately 3,000 different tribes. Now, this does not include the languages and dialects formed amongst the descendants of Africans in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and these United States. But the truth is, the terror of colonialism and enslavement created a global African diaspora that has even further diversified African people, making us a global nation of many tribes. Now, this means that it is easy for Black people to believe that we have more differences between us than similarities. But the reality is that we are all being globally, systematically targeted for extermination and disenfranchisement for no other reason than our race and nationality. The tragedy is that there aren't many willing to stand up and say for my people. There aren't many willing to declare the protection and preservation of black people based on our collective Africanness. No, 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 no. Instead, we like to find solidarity in our distinct blackness, therefore finding the destruction of an African from a different tribe, a fatality outside our jurisdiction for justice. Huh. What do I mean? See, African Americans are being falsely arrested, beaten, and even murdered by law enforcement, and Caribbeans are averting their eyes because African Americans are boisterous, uneducated criminals who need to be taught civility. Huh. But Caribbean dreamers are facing deportation, and African Americans are averting their eyes because Caribbeans are ungrateful for the work African Americans have done to allow them to immigrate to the U.S. in the first place. We are all intentionally allowing injustice to happen to one another because we do not identify as one. At some point, we've got to realize like Esther that we are one. We've, we've got to understand that exploitation in Haiti is just as important as gentrification in Harlem. We've got to understand that a travel ban on Nigeria is just as unjust as food deserts in New Orleans. We've got to understand that incarceration in Baltimore is just as unjust as illiteracy in Barbados. We've got to understand that the hopelessness in Chicago is just as unjust as the homelessness in Cape Bird. We've got to be willing to stand up and say, for my people, and it include Jews outside our Benjamite tribe. Remember, Esther was of the tribe of Benjamin. What if she went in there and only saved Benjamites? That's how we like to function. That's how we like to move. We go in and we say when we have an opportunity to do justice, we only want to do justice for the Haitians because we're Haitian. And we only want to do justice for Jamaicans because we're Jamaican. And we only want to do justice for Black Americans because we're Black American. And we only want to do justice for Nigerians because we're Nigerian. We cannot see one another in this kind of multiplicitous, separated fashion, for we are not being attacked in that manner, but rather the attack is on the whole. And so until we recognize that your misfortune and your discrimination and your injustice affects me, even when you live across the pond, then we will not ever see, uh, 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 we will never see justice. The fact is that we are all dispersed Africans affected by the same decree, all affected by the reality that this nation is globally and systematically attempting to destroy us for no other reason than our race and nationality. We all must heed the wisdom of Mordecai for your silence and self-preservation will bring you nothing but destruction on your own house. Esther's declaration for my people shows us her commitment 
to saving all of the Jews from every tribe and not just the Jews from her home tribe of Benjamin and not just the Jews residing in the palace courts. Queen Esther committed to delivering her entire nation from destruction because she found community and oneness in her Jewish identity as a whole. She understood that the call to save the Jews was not an exclusive call to bring salvation to some, a select few, a distinct population. No, the call for salvation was a call to all Jews. This is further seen when Mordecai and Queen Esther get King Ahasuerus to agree to not just sign, but draft counter documents decreeing the Jews protection. In chapter eight, beginning at verse nine, the Bible says on the 23rd day of the third month, that is the month Sivan, the royal scribes were summoned. Everything was written exactly as Mordecai commanded for the Jews to the satraps, the governors, and the officials of the 127 provinces from India to Kush. Hear me. The edict was written for each province in its own language and to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in King Ahasuerus' name and sealed the edicts with the royal signet ring. He sent the documents by mounted couriers who rode fast horses bred in the royal stables. The king's edict gave the Jews in each and every city the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them, including women and children, and to take their possessions as spoils of war. Verse 13, the Bible says a copy of the text issued as law throughout every province was distributed to all the people so the Jews could be ready to avenge themselves against their enemies on that day. In other words, Not only did Esther fight for salvation for every single Jew, but she and Mordecai made sure that their salvation was legally binding and distributed in their own language because salvation does not require assimilation. I'm going to say that again. Salvation does not require assimilation. In the story of Esther, Jews did not have to leave their tribe, move to a new land, and learn a new language in order to benefit from the salvation that she worked for on their behalf. Instead, she took it upon herself to notify them where they were and in a way that they could receive that salvation was being freely given to them. This is not something that we typically practice with the gospel. How many times have we seen ourselves having to receive a gospel in a language that is not unique to us? How many times have we seen black people in the Caribbean and black people in Africa praising God and speaking to God in languages and practices that are not unique to them because our ways and our language and our praise has been demonized. We no longer know how to come to God in our own language. But some point, at some point, we've got to become like Hagar. We've got to get in our wilderness and understand that we can only come to God in a way that is intimate and unique to us. At some point, we've got to name him for ourselves. We've got to sing a song that's unique to us, a song that can't nobody else sing. We've got to say some things that can't nobody else say. We've got to do some things a way that can't nobody else do because we're trying to receive the salvation of God, the legally binding edict that Jesus Christ gave on the cross that says I'm free, that says says I'm no longer bound, that says I'm the head and not the tail, that says I'm above and not beneath, that says I'm a lender and not a borrower, that God who has spoken that freedom over my life, that God does not require that I become the very entity that gave me that gospel. What if we did the same? What if What if we worked to save young black girls from being sex trafficked? What if we saved young black boys from wrongful convictions? What if we evangelized people in Africa and the Caribbean and we didn't force them to assimilate? What if we didn't force them to dress like us and speak like us 
and worship like us? What if we gave them salvation from the systems and structures seeking to destroy and exterminate them and all we did was notify them of their freedom in a language and a way that was familiar to them? What if we started showing people in tangible ways that salvation does not require assimilation? And this is an important lesson to learn from Esther because her narrative also teaches us that when you declare for my people, you are determining in your heart that structures and statutes won't stop you. After receiving Mordecai's wisdom, Queen Esther replied, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She uttered these words because during this time, there was a law that you could only appear before the king if you were invited. If you appeared before the king uninvited, he would need to extend his royal scepter and allow you to approach him. If he did not extend this royal scepter, you'd be killed. This decree went for everyone in the kingdom, including the queen. This is why Esther says, I will go to the king even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. How many of us are willing to go against the law to ensure someone else's freedom? To break the law to ensure someone else's salvation? In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King said, quote, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. This is what we see Queen Esther demonstrating for us, the moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws due to the superseding moral responsibility to fight for the protection and preservation of her people. See, the truth is many of us struggle declaring for my people because many of us are still comfortable with the status quo, so much so that we allow the sins of injustice to creep into our workplaces, to creep into our schools and creep into our very churches. And we say absolutely nothing because we are afraid of termination, termination from our jobs, termination from our families, termination from our departments. But when you believe in the responsibility of for my people, you believe that it is better to die demanding the love of God be seen in the earth than to live silently waiting for his physical return in the face of destruction. God is looking for a generation of believers that are willing to take up the mantle of our foremothers and say, for my people, mass incarceration will be a bondage of the past. For my people, illiteracy will be illegal. For my people, diabetes will be cured. For my people, food deserts will be filled with grocery stores. For my people, debt will be paid off and familial wealth generated. For my people, mental health will be normalized. For my people, girls will grow up knowing that they can be a preacher for justice, a strategist for justice, an organizer for justice, a fundraiser for justice, a cook for justice, a singer for justice, a teacher for justice, the face of justice. God is looking for a generation of believers who are willing to stand up face to face against power and privilege and declare with Queen Esther for my people. And if I perish, I perish. And see, the beauty of the gospel is that we serve a God who looked at the condition of humanity. He saw that we live in a kingdom ruled by an enemy who believes his sole purpose is to set us on the path of destruction, death, and extermination. He saw the decree that Satan drafted. And not only did Jesus waltz into Satan's kingdom uninvited, but with the sting of every whiplash, Jesus said for my people, with every gasp of air. Jesus said for my people with the throb 
weeping of every broken bone, Jesus set for my people with a crown of thorns pressed into his skull. Jesus set for my people with nails hammered into his hands. Jesus set for my people with a sword pierced in his side. Jesus set for my people with a body drenched in blood. Jesus set for my people by dying on the cross. Jesus perished so that we don't have to. In fact, before he died in John 3, 16 and 17, the Bible says that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wait, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Church, it is time that we activate it and see humanity as one family in need of holistic salvation. It's time that we declare with our foremothers for my people. And if I perish, I perish. Esther's story is a foreshadowing of the spiritual salvation that Christ brings to us with his life. But in the lives and narratives of both Jesus and Esther, we see that salvation is best experienced holistically. We see that God did not send his son into the world to only forgive sin, but he also sent him into the world to save the socially dead. He sent his son to save us from the spiritual and social structures that seek out our destruction, death, and extermination. For the turning over the tables of economic exploitation, communing with women, raising the dead, or teaching about everlasting life, Jesus expressed that salvation is the articulation and actualization of holistic freedom for any creature bound by powers that oppress them physically, socially, and spiritually. In other words, the God you serve was not so heavenly minded that he was of no earthly good. The God you serve cares that your education is subpar. The God you serve cares that you were racially profiled. The God you serve cares that you were sexually assaulted. The God you serve cares that you were physically abused. The God you serve cares that you are enslaved to porn, drugs, or alcohol. The God you serve cares that in both your spiritual and social life, you find yourself sold to death, destruction, and extermination. Jesus Christ is available to offer you the spiritual salvation you need. And the church is open to offer you the social salvation you need. The Holy Spirit has sent me to tell you that we must become partners with Christ in the holistic salvation of the world. He sent me to tell you to receive this salvation. It is free. It does not require assimilation. There is no reason that anyone should be lost. The decree has been updated. You are no longer sold to destruction, death, and extermination. Receive the gift of life and liberty. Many have already perished so that you don't have to. Today is all about saying yes. I want you to hear me tonight. We must get to a point where we declare for my people. And if I perish, I perish. We've got to get to a point where we can say that we are willing to dedicate our service to the salvation of other people. And we've got to get to the point where we say, God, I need saving. God, I am someone who is under under the decree of destruction, death, and extermination. And I need, I need you to save me. I need you to send somebody to save me, God. Spiritually, socially, emotionally. The Lord is trying to save the totality of our being. He wants to use us to do this kind of work. For it is in partnering with God to save people that we inject the character of Jesus Christ back into the earth so that people might be once again able to see and hear and know what God looks and sounds like again. 
sin has so severed and separated us from God that if I'm if I'm quite honest with you, friends, we no longer know what God looks and sounds like. We no longer know what God looks and sounds like. This week, Ravi Zacharias came out, or the news came out about Ravi Zacharias, a, a, a huge spiritual leader for many, an, an influence, uh, someone who was major in the work of apologetics, um, has several books. He was a serial rapist, used his position of spiritual authority and influence to cloak his sexual misconduct. And many are shaken, their faith is broken. How can the very man that brought me to Christ have such a moral failing? How can I find out about his moral failing only after his death. And this is what I need you to understand. The Lord is in need of a people of character, a people so committed and so connected that they do the will of God at all aspects. It is only by our mirroring, projecting, reflecting of the very character and nature of God that anybody in this postmodern sinful world would even consider believing in a God they cannot see, believing in a God they believe has yet to intervene in their lives, We must be that intervention. We must become those intercessors. We must become the very things that come down into the broken and fallen condition of humanity and insert ourselves into that space and say, I want to show you the God in me. It is in seeing the God in us that they will receive Christ and be saved. that God doesn't wear suits, doesn't praise in a certain way, and doesn't have a certain sound. Not anything that we are familiar with or that we can tie to colonialism. And so the freedom and the call that is on us this evening that I want you to leave this thing with is God, help me to be an agent that saves all people, not just the ones from my tribe. God, help me to be willing to disobey unjust laws so that somebody else might be saved. God, make me willing, make me committed to doing the work or make me committed to saving somebody else by reflecting the loving character of Jesus Christ in the earth. That is is my prayer. That is what my appeal to all of us is. I I ask that even now, uh, I'm, I'm closing. Even now, take some time this, this, this Sabbath evening to go to God in prayer and reflection about these very things. Talk to the Lord about it, for real. Not, let, let's not do any more of this coming on to the lies and just listening to preachers inspire you and shout you down. Like, let, Let's leave this thing and let's go do some work. Let's leave this thing and let's go have a conversation with God. God, Where are the places that I need to be doing the work of salvation? And Holy Spirit, where are the places that you need to empower me to be saved? For none of us are perfect. All of us are in need of a savior. That is my prayer for all of us this evening. 
Let's pray. God, give us a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within us. Blot out our transgressions. Purge us from all of our iniquities. Refine us with your holy fire. God, we ask in this moment that you come in and dwell in us and save us first. God, do what only you can do in spotting out all of our brokenness and our sin and cleaning out the crevices and underneath the rugs and the tables and chairs that, God, we seek to hide our brokenness from you. God, get in there and use that elbow grease and get all of the brokenness that you can find out of us. And when you are done, God, cleaning us out, God, quickly send your Holy Spirit to fill us in Jesus' name. Fill us and consume us and dwell within God. Do not just be a temporary visitor, but God, take up space, take up residence in our hearts right now that your Holy Spirit's fire might be able to permeate out of our being, that every single place we go, when somebody has an encounter with us, when somebody has an experience with us, God, they are not experiencing our humanity. God, they're not experiencing our flesh. God, they are only having an experience with you. God, save us so that we can save somebody else. Make us more like you. Help us to reflect your image. Help us to live a life that is dedicated to saying for my people, and if I perish, I perish. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I pray that you were blessed. I'm praying for you.